Welcome back to Revelation chapter 9 Revisited, A Messenger Foretold. Uh, in the last segment, in part 1, we looked at um, some history regarding Revelation chapter 9. Now we'll begin to look at the chapter itself and uh, unfold some of the details that we have in the verses. Chapter 9, verse 1. A, the fifth angel sounds and a star is seen fall from heaven to the earth. Okay? The star was in heaven, it falls to the earth. And to him, it uses a pronoun here to describing who this star is. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Now, in the Greek, the word heaven, aros, uh, perhaps the same as in the New Testament, 3735, uh, the, through the ideal of being elevated or in the sky. Uh, by extension, this is heaven or the abode of God. Okay, So we could recognize from this verse that this star is falling from the place where God lives, the abode of God. Okay, A Seventh-day Adventist pioneer, um, Uriah Smith, who wrote the books Daniel and Revelation, uh, wrote this in regard to this star. He said, A star fell from heaven to the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. He goes on to say, While the Persian monarch contemplated the wonders of his art and power, he received an epistle from the obscure citizen of Mecca, inviting him to acknowledge Muhammad as the apostle of God. Okay? Our pioneers understood this star that fell from heaven to be none other than the prophet Muhammad. Now, I know this is going to be new to some and controversial to others, but this was our historical perspective. And I want you to reconsider this possibility uh, in light of some of the things I'm going to share with you now. The expression bottomless pit, by the way, uh, was defined in the book The Great Controversy. Sister White said that the expression bottomless pit represents the earth in a state of darkness and confusion. This is evident from the scriptures, she says. Okay, So when you see that word, abusos in the Greek, bottomless pit, we can define it with this. The earth in a state of confusion and darkness. Now, in the picture I have on the screen now, um, I discovered something interesting. This is a book that was given to me by a Muslim, published by a Muslim publisher uh, to try to educate people in regard to Islam. And I know it's probably hard to see in the slide, but in this Islamic book, it references Arabia, and next to the, uh, the word Arabia in darkened letters, a subtitle to a paragraph, it says the abyss of darkness. Now that's very interesting because in the scriptures this star is seen falling into a bottomless pit, the Greek word being abusos, which basically means a pit, an obscure place, a place, uh, an empty, a place of emptiness, desolation. Uh, this is interesting because if you look at really old maps of Arabia, it's often referenced on the map as being the empty quarter, okay? So this is a desolate area. This is a desert, uh, a very harsh environment, okay? So it would very um, accurately describe the word abusos in the Greek, would very accurately describe Saudi Arabia, okay? And even the Muslims from their own sources recognize Arabia to be an abyss, to be an abusos, okay, of darkness no less, okay. So Sister White defines the term as being the world in a state of darkness, and I found it very interesting in an Islamic book that they define Arabia in similar terms. Now, abusos from the Greek we've already discussed is emptiness, void, okay, but we have uh, a definition given to us through inspiration 
the earth in a state of darkness and confusion. So, using the rules of biblical interpretation, if we paint Muhammad as the star that fell, and heaven being the abode of God, and a key representing authority being given to someone. Naturally, if I wanted to walk through a door and it was locked, you would need a key to unlock it. The key would give you the right or the authority to enter in through that door. Okay, so we're going to define this phrase, this key, as being the authority of God in this instance. Okay, and the bottomless pit being the earth in a state of darkness and confusion. So let's look at Revelation 9 one more time and let's add some interpretation, okay? And the fifth angel sounded and I saw Muhammad fall from the abode of God unto the earth, or a message that was given to Muhammad may be a better way of describing this. And to him, to this messenger Muhammad, was given the key or the authority of God of the earth in a state of darkness and confusion. Now, this is interesting if you interpret the verse like this, uh, because the Muslims also have an interesting roadmap that could lead them to this prophecy in their own book, the Quran. As I was studying the Quran one afternoon, I came upon chapter 53 in the Quran. Now, I was interested to discover the name of this chapter is simply the star. Now let me just read you a couple verses from chapter 53. In verse 1 it says, By the star, when it goes down. Now this is interesting. In Revelation chapter 9 verse 1, the very first verse in this chapter regarding the fifth trumpet angel, you have a star that's falling from heaven. Okay. Once again, in this chapter, you see a star and it's going down. In verse 2 it says, Your companion Muhammad is neither astray nor is he misled, nor does he say aught but of his own desire. It is no less than inspiration sent down to him. He was taught by one mighty in power. Now the context of the entire rest of this chapter is to try to establish the validity of the message that Muhammad shared. Trying to establish the fact that this was inspired by God, not by man, or not by some vain desire uh, that this desert prophet had. Okay? That's the context of chapter 53. It's interesting that it's called the star. If Muslims were reading the Quran, if they were familiar with this chapter, and they opened the Bible to Revelation chapter 9, and were shown that there is a prophecy about their prophet in the Bible, and they looked at the details of these prophecies and matched them with their own book, they would be greatly encouraged and have been, I know from personal experience. Why is the star not Satan? Now, I have to ask this question. I understand some of my, uh, my dear friends in the academic community have a different interpretation regarding the star that's fallen, and they attribute this uh, star uh, as being Satan. Now, this is why I would have to disagree with that particular uh, perspective. In chapter 9, verse 2, it says that he opened the bottomless pit. The key opens the bottomless pit, the earth in a state of darkness and confusion, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, okay? As the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now some people would look at this verse, including Uriah Smith, in his book Daniel and the Revelation. And they would say that, look, this smoke comes out of the pit, and it obscures or darkens the sun, which gives light. And some would try to superimpose uh, an explanation of this as being the, the errors of Islam covering up the light which represents the Word of God. But nowhere in Bible is smoke defined in such terms. It's interesting, if you study the word smoke throughout the Bible, in every instance, it's one of two things. It's either smoke from a fire, okay? You set wood on fire, it begins to smoke, okay? That's one explanation for the word smoke in the Bible. The other is always 
In every instance, smoke is used to describe the presence of God or the wrath or anger of God being poured out against apostasy. Now that's very interesting given the context of this chapter and the timeline for this chapter, okay? And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Notice the next verse. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing. Now that's what locusts do by nature. They attack green things. No, no, God says, do not do that. Neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should torment them for five months. Okay. Now recently we've had some academic study of the five months in prophecy, and we have unearthed quite a bit of evidence to establish our prophetic interpretation as the pioneers explained uh, of these five months describing the first trumpet, okay, uh, under the first trumpet time frame of the conflicts that existed between the Muslims and the tribal wars uh, with the Eastern Romans that took place um, starting in 1299, lasting through uh, 14, I uh, can't even see my own chart right here, but you, you can see the dates if we'll enlarge uh, the timeline so that you could see it better and you could recognize the dates as our pioneers described for the five months, okay? What's interesting about what I just read is that you have a locust army that's coming out of the smoke, that's coming out of the earth in a state of darkness and confusion, okay? And what does this locust army do? They attack this group of people that does not have the seal of God. Now, I ask you the question, if this is Satan, if Satan is given a key or the authority of the earth in a state of darkness and confusion, and he goes down and he unlocks this abusos, this obscure, void, empty place, and out of this empty place comes a smoke, which the Bible always uses to describe the presence or the wrath of God against apostasy in every example. And the smoke, out comes locusts. And the locusts do what? They attack the people that do not have God's seal in their forehead. Now, does that make sense to you? Common sense. From a, a military perspective, for example. Jesus in Matthew 12, verse 25, said uh, that they, he knew their thoughts and he said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then would his kingdom stand? You see, Jesus is being accused here of casting out demons by the power of Satan himself. And he said, this is ridiculous. This is a ridiculous assumption for you to make. How would Satan's house stand if he was divided against his own purpose, okay? If Satan has people in this world that serve him, okay, and he unleashes an army against his own people, those who have not the seal of God in their foreheads, what would be the wisdom in this, I ask? To me, Satan, it's hard to fit him into this scenario. I don't think the context allows uh, for that interpretation. Uh, but to each his own. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Okay? I believe that this is the Arab armies, the Muslim armies, that under this particular trumpet fought, began to, to have conflict with the Eastern Romans, Okay, which were being ruled by the Roman Catholic Church by this time, the apostasy being firmly established after 538. Okay, we're, we're moving down uh, many years later in, in the fifth trumpet time frame, and you have these skirmishes with this apostate Roman power. Okay, why? We will discover as we continue to unfold the prophecies of Daniel chapter 9. Please come back and join us for the next segment.